Okay, I'm here with Paul Norris and Mark Beckwith on the Middleway podcast, and we have a very special episode today. We're going to be having a friendly debate or conversation, not quite sure what to name this yet, but a discussion on the topic of gun policy in the United States. So I'm so honored for you both to be here. Just to give us a little bit of sense of where we're going, I'm going to introduce you both and set a bit of context for the conversation. We'll talk about some guidelines or goals for the conversation, and then we'll go ahead and jump in with the discussion questions. So let me introduce our guests. First, we have Paul Norris. Paul is a graduate of UC Berkeley. He has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's in counseling. A gun owner from age 12, he's an NRA benefactor member and an advocate for gun safety. Paul is currently retired, but still works part-time in counseling. He's active in Braver Angels, serving as a moderator, state coordinator, and an associate director and chair in the debate program. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks uh, for inviting me. Really happy to be here. Really hopeful about a good conversation. And Mark, Mark Beckwith is a graduate of Amherst College and Yale Divinity School. He's the retired Bishop of Newark of the Episcopal Church and currently does coaching, spiritual direction, and works part-time in the Diocese of Western Mass. Mark is co-founder of Bishops United Against Gun Violence and serves on the community partners team at Braver Angels. He's the author of the book, Seeing the Unseen, Beyond Prejudices, Paradigms, and Party Lines, which I will link to in our show notes. And he also blogs at markbeckwith.net. Mark, thank you for being here as well. Thank you, Matt, for uh, inviting us into this, this opportunity. So I wanted to set a bit of context for our listeners. You both have had two prior conversations before this one and have actually known each other for longer than that. So um, I just wanted to first acknowledge and thank Wilk Wilkerson and the D-Rate the Hate podcast, where you both had conversations on this very topic. So that's sort of the backdrop for today, and we hope to keep the momentum going. I won't go ahead and rehash all of the conversation points that you all have had, other than just to say, I really encourage people to check out those two prior conversations. And that being said, I think our conversation today can still stand on its own. Um, and I also just wanted to thank Braver Angels. I mentioned in both of your introductions that you're both members of Braver Angels, as am I, and they have really been a role model for how to have these complex but good faith conversations on issues that we really disagree with. Um, and I think that we probably wouldn't all be here today without that organization. So I wanted to acknowledge them as well. And then just talk about some of our guidelines and goals for today, which we've agreed upon beforehand. And it's really nothing fancy, just the overarching aim to listen and understand one another. Um, we might learn something new. We might have our mind changed on some point, but fundamentally our goal is just to really understand where the other person is coming from and seeing if we can really get a sense of their opinions and why this matters to them and maybe even find some common ground. So in that vein, if it feels comfortable during the conversation, I'd love for you guys and would encourage to summarize or repeat what you've heard from the other person just to check for understanding if that feels natural and i might prompt that at, at some times um but otherwise i think we can have this be pretty natural i will throw out some prompts for us and give you both a chance to answer and a chance to respond to one another but um I you know don't think we need to have any like limits on one response per, per person or anything like that. We can just have this be an organic conversation and sort of see where it goes. How does that sound? Sounds um, good. I, um, you know, Matthew, uh, I know that you have some opinions. I've listened to some of your podcasts, and even though moderators, you know, typically are not supposed to voice their own views, um, 
I suspect, you know, you might have some things to say that would enhance the conversation. So uh, I invite you to do that, even though I am pretty sure you're on the other side of the issue for me. I would still like to hear what you have to say. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Paul. And you're absolutely right. I am going to do my best to be a moderator, but that doesn't mean that I don't have opinions on these issues. And I will try to interject um, where it feels appropriate. So, well, I wanted to start out from and hear from both of you just about the why, like why we're here, why this topic is so important to you. What in your lived experience has contributed to the position that you have now on this topic of gun policy? And um, Mark, I thought we can start with you. Sure. Uh, part of my faith journey has been a commitment uh, for my whole adult life uh, in promoting nonviolence and uh, and be a, an advocate and uh, adhere to that as a, a fundamental dimension of who I am. And when the Newtown, Connecticut shooting happened almost 10 years ago, uh, that galvanized my colleague bishops and we formed a network uh, of bishops from around the country uh, called ourselves Bishops United Against Gun Violence. And uh, that was um, an opportunity we saw to make witness, use our voice, uh, exercise uh, what influence we had in various uh, situations to uh, reduce the level of gun violence. And uh, as part of that process, I learned uh, a couple of things. One, very important, um, that the term gun control uh, is, is an unhelpful term uh, because my experience is as soon as you say gun control, it divides people into different sides of the room and conversation uh, becomes very difficult to, uh, to proceed. So uh, I've used the, the term gun safety, which I think is a little more expansive. Um, I think there may be other metaphors that we can use, but uh, have learned in the course of time that uh, need to engage uh, not just people who uh, live on um, what I would call my side of, uh, of the divide, but uh, to engage people like Paul who have a different um, orientation, a different perspective on this very important issue. Yeah, thank you for that, Mark. Paul. Yeah, so um, I mean, already, you know, there is uh, there's a great deal of commonality there. Um, I uh, am definitely a proponent of nonviolence. <clears throat> I have come to learn uh, that it, it has a lot of subtleties. Um, in particular, um, one of the most important things that comes up, uh, how does nonviolence work when uh, somebody else doesn't play by the same rules? And nonviolence has a huge place uh, in my practice, particularly with couples. Um, but um, I've come to the view uh, that nonviolence uh, works best when it comes from a place of strength. Uh, and I think that's very important. So from that perspective, I believe in empowering people who might otherwise be victims. Um, and it's interesting, um, more and more I have come uh, to object. Uh, to pretty much the constant phrasing, uh, gun violence. Um, I think that makes an, in, an inherent connection that does not exist. So what I instead ask for is that we talk about gun policy to reduce violence. And in doing that, we're recognizing that a firearm can be used to prevent violence as a credible threat. Um, to not be in a place of weakness uh, in the face of somebody who would perpetrate a crime. Um, and for me, gun safety uh, means people, and I, you know, definitely believe in gun safety. Uh, guns, you know, I belong to the NRA. I'm a benefactor member. The NRA has been teaching gun safety for over 100 years. 
Uh, but to me, gun safety means people have access to guns. Uh, people who have uh, who do not have a history of violence um, or other factors that we might get into, suicidality, um, in some cases, you know, uh, what we call mental illness. Uh, but to me, gun safety means people have access to guns and they're trained to use them safely, not that we get safety by denying access to guns or tying, you know, tying them up in a maze of regulations. Um, so that's, that's how, uh, that's how I see it. Yeah. Paul, you mentioned, um, this idea of coming from a place of strength and empowerment and defense and looking at guns serving that utility versus kind of more of a offensive threat. And I suspect that that might be one point where, uh, there might be some slight disagreement there and we will definitely get to that. Um, but before we do, I thought we could still linger a little bit longer on what we and what you both have in common here um, as far as your perspectives and, and values. And I'm just going to state one here, and it seems blatantly obvious, but I think because of the polarization on this topic and how our view of the other side can be so distorted, it's still worth saying, is that you both mentioned the the word nonviolence, and it goes without saying that you both would like to see less people injured or killed by guns. And again, that seems really obvious, but again, the distortion can, and the, the emotional valence of this issue can make it seem as though sometimes that people don't care about other people's lives. And I know that you both very much do. Um, but I'm wondering where else you guys agree. You've had two prior conversations and I think I'll just open this up to either or both of you. Based on these conversations, wh where do you think are those areas where you actually find common ground and agreement? I'll, I'll take a, um, a stab at that. Uh, several years ago, I went to a gun show to learn more about the gun culture. And, and uh, Paul's heard me tell this story before. And, and when I was at this gun show, I was listening to a language that I didn't understand. Uh, it wasn't that people were speaking something other than English, but they were talking about uh, about guns and accessories and calibers and all these metaphors that were somewhat foreign to me. And uh, and two things emerged from that. One is I'd like to understand this language, but more importantly, I realized that the conversation was yes about guns. But deeper than that, it was about American culture, a slice of American culture that has been part of uh, us since the beginning. And uh, there's a part of me that doesn't want to acknowledge that. Uh, but as I was listening to people, I realized, oh, I, that needs to be honored. That needs to be honored. And what often happens from uh, people on my side and the many conversations and the work that we're doing, uh, people come with a level of arrogance and self-righteousness uh, that makes conversation engagement uh, with the, someone who differs almost impossible. And uh, I think it's important to recognize uh, that, uh, that guns are in foundational component of American history. Uh, whether they should be or should not be, that's another whole issue. But the fact is that guns have been a part of our life in a way that I suspect other countries have not had uh, that same experience, that long uh, tradition of, of gun involvement. So um, I that was something that I have learned in the course of of, of, uh, of my work in uh, reducing gun violence. Mm -hmm. Paul, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, you know, thank you for that, Mark. Um, um, that that opens lots of doors, and arrogance and self righteousness uh, has definitely been on my side as well. Um, one of the things that people on my side uh, often really have difficulty with is um, just a lack of patience. Uh, 
uh, a lack of patience with the things that people on the other side think that they know about guns uh, that for us are utterly fallacious. Um, but again, you know, uh, we could definitely use uh, less arrogance and uh, and some more patience on our side. Um, I would add, uh, I have, I don't know if it ever actually happened, but it certainly could have happened uh, that I would have gone to a uh, Buddhist psychotherapy training at Spirit Rock on Saturday uh, and then gone and worked uh, uh, the NRA booth at a gun show uh, recruiting people on Sunday. Two very different crowds. And, you know, two very different crowds and, um, you know, feeling very much a part of both of them. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I am, I'm, you know, pretty definitely bilingual uh, in this area. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't tout that as a particularly big deal. Um, but it's kind of, it's an advantage, you know, in a conversation like this, I guess I would say that. Absolutely. And I just name it at that. Well, thank you both for that. Um, and so it sounds, you know, from both of your responses, there is this recognition, whether we like it or love it or not, guns are part of our culture. And the question is, what do we do about it to keep people safer and happier? So the first uh, question that I wanted to bring forward is around whether we should be focusing more on guns or people. There are so many questions about gun policy. Is it a mental health issue? Should we be restricting guns? Should we, we re should should we be restricting people who have access to guns? Should we be focusing on something else? And I think all of these questions boil down to an essential question, which is, what's the problem here? Is it our guns the problem or are people the problem? And so I thought we could start off by maybe just trying to hit the nail on the head here. Um, Mark, let me start with you. And it doesn't have to be an either or, but how would you respond to that? Well, I, I, I'm thinking of a researcher who I know um, in Boston who said that um, some guns should uh, be restricted to, um, to all people and all guns should be restricted to some people. And uh, that sort of is uh, a tension that I think we're, uh, we're, we're wrestling with. Uh, there are 400 million guns, so estimated. And I remember a recent Braver Angels uh, debate, someone who was on the pro-gun side said, we have 400 million guns. Even if you wanted to, to reduce that number, that's going to take a long time. So, so how do we deal with that, with all those guns? Uh, and I would add that many of those guns, and it's... Uh, I'm sure there's disputed uh, um, data as to how many guns are unsecured in uh, people's homes. But with that many guns, there are guns that are unsecured, such that um, the estimate is that four and a half million kids in this country live in homes that have unsecured guns, which is, to my mind, an accident wait waiting to happen. So how can we um, make homes more safe? And I work with a, um, a coalition in New Hampshire, and uh, one of the gun trainers has done a video of uh, for people who have their self-defense plan, who have uh, weapons nearby uh, at night, but he showed several devices uh, that kept them locked, but can be unlocked very, very quickly, uh, which is a security measure and a safety measure that I uh, that I think um, we need to consider and 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 make more available. Yeah, Paul, what are your thoughts? Is the problem more about guns or more about people? Well, there is such a thing as uh, beating somebody to death with hands and feet and superior size or killing somebody, you know, with uh, an implement that comes to hand. So, so again, for me, I don't make this automatic association between guns and violence um, that I think I hear so often. Uh, 
you know, so violence to me is a separate issue um, from guns. They interact, but they are separate issues. I don't see them as inherently together. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, it, so it's it, for me, it's primarily people. I mean, I guess I might as well just come right out and say that. And, um, you know, we talk about the gun culture, and I think this is also a misnomer. There are multiple gun cultures. Um, there are the there's the gun culture of gangs, um, you know, as uh, one can hear in rap music. Um, and that's, you know, uh, a whole huge number of factors go into gangs and guns, uh, the money to be made from drugs. Um, and there's a uh, there is actually a very, very small gun culture, I think. Uh, of mass shooters. Um, you know, it's not like they get together, you know, in meetings, you know, once a month, but uh, these mass shooters do seem to be aware of each other. They seem to be aware of the kill count uh, that their predecessors have had. So that is a gun culture uh, that as far as I'm concerned, you know, the mainstream NRA gun culture uh, has no use for whatsoever, does not abet and aid. Um, so that's one thing. And I guess, you know, there are, but again, why is this an issue? Uh, you know, where do the numbers come from, uh, of deaths, uh, by, uh, you know, people who kill themselves with guns, gun homicides, and, you know, it's gangs, uh, to a large extent. And, you know, uh, that's where the numbers for kids killed by guns come from. Those are, that's where the numbers are. Um, suicides is a real thing. Um, mass shootings is very, very small in terms of numbers, but very, very large in terms of people's awareness. Um, and, you know, possibly also, you know, domestic violence, a significant component. Um, so, so I think what I'm trying to say here is there are multiple areas in which this comes up. Uh, and none of these are promulgated or endorsed by the safety gun culture uh, to which I belong. Um, and, you know, Mark, I'm, I'm really, you know, I mean, I hear you, you know, I, I hear your point about unsecured guns. And I, I think I hear, you know, like, there's this, and, you know, tell me if I got this wrong, because maybe I do. But, you know, for you, a kid in a house that has a gun that isn't locked up, uh, seems to be a red flag, you know, danger, danger, danger. Well, <laughs> uh, I grew up in a house with an unsecured gun. It was my gun. Uh, and, you know, I was a kid who was bullied in school. And never in my mind was it even conceivable to make a connection between that gun and, you know, anything other uh, than going out and, you know, target shooting or maybe hunting. So, you know, I guess I would mention that. And, you know, uh, you talk about, I mean, I know, you know, there are like these uh, safes, you know, supposedly that, um, you know, some of them work on fingerprints or you press a bunch of buttons in a proper sequence. But there's something to realize, you know, when you're in a self-defense situation, like let's see you hear somebody, you know, banging around in your house or they're actually opening your door. Um, Fine motor skills are gone. They just disappear. Um, and so the ability to open up something, you know, like a safe, even if it's something you can do really easily most of the time, um, I just don't see it, you know? I mean, I think about, you know, my iPhone, you know? How often uh, does the fingerprint ID on my iPhone take five tries before it opens? So, so I guess those are my main points. Um, but the primary thing is um, what I what I endorse, again, is a culture where guns are freely available um, and a culture of safety is formed. And you don't just have to uh, kid-proof your guns. You can also gun-proof your kids um, by teaching them the fundamentals uh, of gun safety or at a much uh, younger level, uh, you know, there's the Yeti Eagle program from NRA, which is, you know, if you see a gun, don't touch it, leave the room, tell an adult. 
strangely enough, you know, uh, liberal uh, school districts don't seem to have any use for the Eddie Eagle program. Funny thing about that. Fundamental lesson, though, of safety. One, one thing that uh, Paul has um, uh, pointed out to me, and he, he mentioned it earlier, because uh, I use the term gun culture, and in an earlier conversation, Paul said uh, there are several gun cultures. And uh, Paul, you didn't mention Hollywood this time, which is clearly a gun culture and, and uh, celebrates gun violence uh, because it sells. Um, so there are lots of different levels of gun culture. And what often happens is people on my side sort of lump everybody in. And so somebody like Paul, who is uh, uh, committed to safety, uh, gets uh, put in the same category with people who are wanton uh, or violent or um, uh, disrespectful of their weapon. So, uh, and I can understand that that's a that's a, uh, um, a a problematic place to be in. So uh, Paul's opened me up to that. And I think we uh, who are uh, advocates for reducing gun violence need to be clear about the various gun cultures. That said, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Guns have been a, a integral part of American uh, uh, history. And uh, um, <laughs> I'd like that to be different, but that history is is clearly part of who we are and we need to deal with it. And just getting rid of guns uh, isn't going to work. That said, I think there are some provisions that can be made. For example, uh, several years ago, I took a gun class. Uh, I was living in Massachusetts at the time and the gun class uh, gave me the certification to go out and pur purchase a gun. And uh, I was horrified because uh, one morning of taking a gun class and shooting uh, five rounds uh, equipped me, uh, at least as far as the, the law was concerned, to own a gun. I, <laughs> I had no ability uh, to do that. I was totally unskilled uh, in, in using this. And the law enables uh, people to purchase guns without hardly any experience or exposure to uh, the intricacies of, of firing or loading or maintaining or keeping a, a weapon safe. So uh, something should be done around that, it seems to me. And, and uh, there are all sorts of movements to try and um, upgrade the training of people uh, who feel the need to own guns and uh, as part of their self-defense plan. Paul, I don't know if you wanted to respond to any of that, the training piece or any anything else that Mark just mentioned there. Yeah, well, thanks, you know, thanks for reminding me about the Hollywood gun culture, um, which I did forget to mention this time. And um, yeah, I guess, uh, So I'm torn here. I'm, I'm torn. Um, I certainly agree uh, that people uh, who own guns and let's say people who uh, carry concealed uh, should have training, should have experience. And I have done extensive training, uh, including training with um, uh, um, recon Marines uh, who opened up uh, their own school and, you know, and they practiced, uh, you know, a lot of really, really advanced exercises. So, yes, that's true. I, you know, um, so, but from a, from a position of promoting and suggesting that <clears throat> is different, I think, from legally mandating it. And one reason for this is um, the primary use of a gun in self-defense, uh, as shown by statistics, and I think there are good statistics for this one. I don't think anybody really argues about this one. Maybe I'm wrong. I'll find out. But um, the proper purpose of a gun is to display it and show that you have it and convince the person who was about to mug you or burglarize you 
or rob you that maybe they should reconsider their plans and just kind of turn around and walk away. So it doesn't take a whole lot of skill uh, to display a firearm and look as if you're willing to use it. Um, so that's one thing. And uh, there's the question of accessibility. Um, you know, I mean, the state of California uh, has just passed I don't know if they passed it yet or if it's in the works, but it's going to get signed. Um, setting out new guidelines for what it takes to get a concealed carry permit. And it's clearly designed to make it as difficult as possible um, to take it out of the reach uh, of people, um, let's say people who are not the elites. You know, we're probably all elites here. You know, we're all highly educated. Uh, we probably all live in good neighborhoods. We probably all live in, you know, a place that's fairly safe. Um, not everybody has that luxury. So, again, I'm of two minds. But I, if you ask me, well, what do I think my solution is? Uh, my solution is I don't really think that this has been demonstrated to be a problem. Um, What's well, not been this demonstrated to be a problem, Paul? I want to make that, sure. Uh, you know, people with concealed carry permits uh just basically don't get into trouble they just basically don't cause problems um and who knows why that is you know it's it, they are a very self-selected group it's usually maybe one percent two percent of the population it's not everybody um but you know the places where they're most likely to get in trouble is to forget that they're carrying the gun and you know to like go to an airport with it and forget that they have it um and so, so in this case, I would go with the numbers. Uh, I would go with the experience of the states that have have adopted wide, you know, they have adopted shall issue, which means you get that concealed carry permit unless there is a very, very definite proven reason why you shouldn't have it. The um, uh, I I'm following uh, what you're saying, but what's um, emerging for me. Uh, when I lived in Massachusetts, which has, uh, and New Jersey, two places that I lived, which had rather restrictive gun laws, the level of suicide in that state was like half of what it was in Colorado, which had more relaxed gun laws. So the more relaxed gun laws, the higher the suicide rate. Uh, I live in New Hampshire now, 80% of gun deaths in New Hampshire are suicide. And uh, so again, it's a kind of an accident waiting to happen. Uh, and uh, there are people on the, um, in the gun rights side who recognize this, that we need to work together to reduce the level of suicide. Uh, so ERPO, uh, Extreme Risk Protection Orders, also known as red flag laws, have been, have put, have been put into place. And I know, because um, I know somebody who works in suicide in, in Washington State, her husband took his life with a gun, and uh, she's a clinician herself, teaches uh, at the university level, and they were putting in uh, um, legislation in the state of Washington uh, to essentially a, um, a red flag law, and they engaged somebody from the NRA to help them uh, write this law, and she said the uh, participation and the wisdom of somebody from NRA uh, made the law much better. Uh, she said that person's no longer at the NRA, but but uh, that you know that made it better. There was a, uh, a commitment on all ends to uh, reduce the level of gun suicide. And with suicide, um, if one uses a gun, uh, they are infinitely more effective than somebody who takes pills or jumps off a building or whatever. Uh, it's a very um, effective way of uh of ending one's life so can i just interject for for Please. a second here um because i think that i think that there's been a theme through throughout each of your responses here that's surfacing for me and that's how much regulation should there be how much should states or the federal government come in and put their finger on the scales I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you would both agree that if it was just left up to individuals and individuals didn't act 
you know, maliciously towards other people or weren't violent towards themselves, there would be no need for any sort of regulation or restrictions. So, you know, what I was hearing Paul saying is that, um, yes, there should, people should have training with guns, but we don't need someone else to tell us to do that training. In other words, we don't need the government to tell us that. And what I was hearing Mark saying in the suicide point is that, well, it'd be nice if we can trust people, you know, not to use their guns to commit suicide. But the fact of the matter is, um, when there have been heavier restrictions on guns, that's less than suicide. So, you know, coming to this point here, the question is how much should the government intervene? And I guess maybe let me go to Paul on this. Um, if we can't trust people to, it would be nice if we could trust people to be safe with guns, but if we can't trust people to be safe with guns and gun restrictions would at the end of the day, reduce the number of deaths, um, why not be in favor of that? Well, first of all, I need to back up, um, but I will, I will get to your question. Um, there's something, there's a very important point. Uh, one of the most important points I think that needs to be made here. Uh, correlation does not prove causation. And a good point. any conclusion that one comes to based on correlation um, is suspect. And so, uh, so for example, um, you know, I mean, I, I haven't recently, you know, looked at like, you know, correlation uh, between suicide and gun laws. But if you look at the places that have lots of gun laws, uh, you know, basically they tend to be, you know, like uh, liberal uh, urban places. And, um, you know, and gun ownership is very, very high uh, in rural areas. And the simple fact is that farmers have one of the highest suicide rates of any profession. And it's not really hard to see why, if you understand that uh, most farmers are basically in the process of losing their land because even when they have a good year, uh, they tend to lose money. So there are people who are in a horrendous situation. So, um, so Mark, if you, uh, if you take one thing away from today, the thing that I would ask you to take away is correlation does not prove causation. And when we come up with these correlational things, there are always many, many, many different underlying factors that I think are far more important uh, than the one that we choose to look at. And I mean, you know, I'm a therapist, you know, I, I assess people for suicidality. Um, if I had a client who was suicidal and owned guns, uh, I would, uh, and it, particularly if, you know, guns seem to be a part of a suicide plan, um, I would really strongly, you know, suggest to them, you know, loan out the guns to somebody and, you know, I might even have to report them, you know, and have the guns taken away. Thank God I haven't had to do that. But I would in my professional capacity. But suicide, suicide is a really complicated thing. And, you know, I'm not sure how well we understand. I, well, I kind of know we don't understand it. Everything I was taught 10 years ago, 10 years ago, is now thrown out the window. Uh, in terms of how to assess suicidality and how to think about it. It's all changed. And, you know, I'm sure that, you know, there are lots of people who do it for lots of different ways, lots of different reasons. Something that I don't think, you know, that we actually deal with in this society is, is somebody's life worth living? Um, you know, there are states of life that are worse than death. There are medical conditions, you know, that are unbearable. So I would really want to know more you know, about who is committing suicide and, you know, are we just, you know, like putting them on a Band-Aid by trying to take away uh, the most, you know, the means that's most at hand and not dealing with what's really going on. Um, well, I think you 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 uh, talked the issue of stress uh, of farmers. I think there's uh, post-traumatic stress of, of veterans. Uh, often suicide is... Um, a response to an impulse. 
And uh, some say, and I don't think there's, there's uh, clinical evidence to back this up, but it sort of in some ways makes some sense. It's the 10 minute rule. Somebody is feeling desperate. And in, in that 10 minutes, if they have access to a gun, they may, may try and kill themselves. If that 10 minutes passes, the crisis passes and they won't try and do that. And I think you and I would agree that in those moments, uh, it would be good to surrender one's weapon to a person that they trust. Uh, look, I'm not in a good place right now. Can you hold my weapon for a while? Uh, what I understand is that uh, when the uh, red flag laws have been introduced, uh, what many people feel is this is government overreach and I'm not going to let the government stand in and tell me what I can hone and what I cannot hone. So it's... it's uh, more about an issue of the government intruding, uh, government overreach than the issue of suicide. And that often gets mixed into all of this, uh, which I think is uh, makes it harder to move the whole issue forward. I totally agree. Um, yeah. And, you know, you said a lot of things, I mean, that I definitely agree with. Um, you know, I, my ears really perked up when you said engage somebody from NRA to help write the law. I mean, if we wanted to change this whole game, uh, if we could establish a level of trust such that the NRA and people on your side, you know, could actually sit down and talk about, okay, what kind of a gun law would actually help make people safe without infringing on the rights uh, of those who are not a danger to themselves or others, you know, this would be a whole nother ball game. Uh, I mean, I would definitely love to see that. Um, and you are absolutely right that, you know, in the last 10 years, my most recent suicide training, you know, a suicide prevention training has put a focus on impulsivity, which was not even mentioned 10 years ago. So this is something, you know, that people have come to understand. There are, there are definitely people who, if you can prevent them, you know, in that immediate period, if you can prevent them from ending their lives, um, you know, they can go on. And who knows, you know, what the rest of their life will be like after that. But you are naming something that is a factor, you know, that I definitely agree with. Um, but let me, you know, something about red flag laws. Okay, so uh, one of the things that has been proposed recently and might even be law now is that um, if a restraining order is taken out against someone, uh, they immediately have to surrender their guns to the police. Um, and it's not even like a time thing. It's like, you know, they surrender them and then they can go through a court process to try to get them back. Well, there's a problem here. You know, if a restraining order only says that you can't be within 100 feet of somebody who you're supposed to be leaving alone, that's no infringement on your life. You know, you can just go to a different coffee shop. And getting a and restraining then, order. You said again, I'm not sure I follow. I just want to make sure I follow that. If, if you have a restraining order, say it again. I... Yeah, well, so so one of the versions of red flag laws is if a restraining order is taken out against someone, mm -hmm. they have to surrender all their guns to the police. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's not a time frame thing. It's like, you know, they're going to have to go to court to get them back. Is mm -hmm. this so, in a particular state or... Uh, you know, I think this is the case in California now, or at least something they're proposing. So getting a restraining order really doesn't require any due process. You know, somebody just has to go and say, you know, I feel unsafe. I want a restraining order. And as long as a restraining order doesn't mean taking away somebody's guns, it's not really infringing on their rights very much at all. So it's okay that it doesn't have a lot of due process. But when it involves somebody giving up their guns, what it means is that somebody can just go to court, say, you know, I'm afraid of this person without any evidence whatsoever. Uh, and that person has to surrender their guns. So to me, you know, that's something that has a good intention. And if it had due process, I would be in agreement with it. But, you know, it's overreach. But uh, do I... Uh, am I led to understand that if somebody asks for a restraining order, are you suggesting that there is not due process in getting a restraining order? No, there isn't. They're very easy to get. It's not been my experience. 
Okay, well, it may differ in different places. Uh, that that uh, there is a due process that one has to submit um, uh, th their level of, of of threat and and have a um, a history of of that and present that to somebody who is an impartial observer who has some experience and then can issue the restraining order or not. And as we know, some people who have been issued restraining orders um, breach them and come back and, and uh, engage in violence against the person they're not supposed to be near. So yeah. if they have a gun, they're going to have more opportunity and be uh, more effective in, in, uh, in inflicting harm on someone else. Mark. So I think that's a that's a key issue. Uh, something that I want to talk about, and 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 this mm, is where I wrestle. Paul, you said earlier on that uh, committed to nonviolence, and nonviolence uh, sometimes can be best uh, best um, uh, undertaken if somebody is coming from a place of strength. So if you have a gun you're less likely to be violent. But as I hear that, there is, as I'm hearing it, an anticipation that someone else, you're anticipating that someone else is going to be a threat. And I can't bring myself to assume that. And I think there's a fundamental difference uh, between people who have guns that, oh, I need to be protected from people who may be a threat to people like me who would say, um, yes, people can be threatening, but not in my day-to-day -day life. And I think there's a difference there. And I think uh, because I don't feel that threat from others. Uh, and you could say that I'm naive, that I should uh, uh, honor, you know, um, the fact that some people may be out to hurt me, uh, but I, I can't, and some of this is from my, my, my personal religious faith, I can't start with that. I guess, you know, I would respond to that. Um... I mean, it's possible uh, to be hyper aware and to be seeing threats where no threat exists. Uh, it's possible to be someone who walks down the street and fears people because of the way they look or the way they dress without paying any attention to body language or something like that. Um, it's also possible uh, to be uh, somebody, you know, who walks down the street and just can't imagine uh, that there could be any threat coming to them from anywhere. Um, you know, that everything is fine and the world is safe. And um, uh, what I believe is uh, something that falls in the middle of those two. Um, you know, maybe it's something that I would call situational awareness. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and you and I live in very different places. Um, uh, you've probably heard the, uh, the classic, uh, uh, a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged. Uh, well, I have been mugged. Um, although I have to admit the last time I kind of cleverly got out of it, uh, by acting crazy. Uh, and that actually worked quite well. I, but I would have frankly rather have had a gun, um, in that situation. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I believe in situational awareness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I walk down the street. And and, introduce, and interestingly, I mean, you know, if, uh, if, as has happened, I encounter somebody who is clearly having some kind of mental difficulties, um, you know, they're shouting or they're talking to themselves. Uh, or I remember once, you know, I used the cane. And, you know, when guys started yelling at me, I hope you're proud of your cane, uh, uh, if I had one, they'd take it away from me and beat me with it. Um, but I didn't feel particularly threatened by that. Um, although if the guy had, you know, started coming up and, you know, getting in my face, I might have felt threatened. 
so again, you know, it's situational awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, it's funny. I went walking with my granddaughters uh, the other day, you know, and they live in Millbrae, you know, a nice safe suburb. And, you know, I'm telling them, you know, be aware of your surroundings, look around you, cross the street, don't believe, you know, don't trust that cars are going to stop just because there's a stop sign. Um, even if you're on the sidewalk, you know, kind of keep an eye out. Cars have been known to run up on a sidewalk and hit people. So, yeah, so I neither believe in being hyper aware, looking for danger, and so hyper aware that one may create danger that doesn't really exist. Neither do I believe in walking down the street, uh, feeling safe and comfortable in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Someplace else might be a very different story. Yeah. Well, and, and we talked about this earlier, the whole issue of fear and trust. And uh, I, I've often referred to guns as fear transfer machines, that if somebody is coming at you uh, and is threatening to attack, a gun will thwart the attack either by shutting them down or indeed killing them. And then the fear is then taken away. And I would say yes for a moment, but the fear then escalates, it metastasizes. And we live in a culture where so many people are afraid. And how do we deal with our fear? And my experiences or my feeling is that guns don't help in dealing with fear. So there, there's, um, this is- Why, this is uh, do I get to quickly respond to that? Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, Paul. I mean, I would bet that all three of us here would like to see a very, very different society. Um, I would like to see a society where I could not imagine any purpose for a gun other than target shooting. Uh, maybe hunting, but I'm not really a hunter. I would love to live in that society, uh, but I don't. And I don't believe that we're going to get that society uh, by taking away guns. Um, we have very, very deep fundamental problems of disunity. Um, and I don't think mental health is a big enough term to describe uh, what a lot of the problems of our society are. Um, I mean, basically, I think we are a sick, insane society. Uh, and we are not even beginning to deal with that. I, I want I want to pick up on that, Paul. It's actually my next question. And there's a... I, I'm just torn between moving on to this and and talking more about this issue of fear and whether more guns make us more or less safe, but maybe that'll be for later or next conversation. But um, Paul, you were mentioning the sickness in our society. And this question, I have been really eager to ask you both. On the one hand, we have Paul, who's a mental health therapist, and we have Mark, um, who's a bishop. And my question is about the mental health and the spiritual state of our society. So obviously there's been this trend towards more and more mass shootings, these kind of horrific um, events. And, you know, one would be right to point out that these are, are outliers as far as gun violence is concerned, but nonetheless, just terrible and uh, make us all sick to our stomach. So with this with this rise in mass shootings and this rise in hate and animosity towards one another um clearly we can't just pin this on guns alone the number of guns although maybe it's been going up recently hasn't you know escalated so much that we can just pin this problem on guns something is going on in the minds of people in the hearts of people in the souls of people that is making this more of a phenomenon and i would like to hear from you both if you have any impressions on what the heck is happening here is it just is it just a matter of this social contagion effect like it's you know it's shown on the news and people want to get the spotlight and there's that social contagion or is there something else happening in our minds and our hearts and our souls um mark <laughs> i'm going to start with you okay uh what what came to my mind as you're saying that matt is that uh the, the temptation that more and more people engage in, and I will fall into it myself, to other someone else, to uh, see someone as other, unrelated, and therefore expendable, or not to be accorded with the respect. 
uh, that they deserve. And we see more and more of that. And uh, that's, that's a problem as polarization increases. Uh, people are more and more retreating into the silos of their security. Uh, and I'm not just talking about guns, I'm talking about their ideological, political, religious security, uh, which reinforces the opinions that they have and enables them to sort of um, uh, lash out to someone else. And I think that's a, uh, that's a real problem. Um, and what's interesting and um, to me, and I think I've talked about this in earlier conversations with Paul, the NRA up until uh, the 1960s was all about gun safety, teaching kids um, uh, how to hold weapons, uh, uh, marksmanship, all of that. Uh, the Second Amendment didn't come become part of the uh, common um, language uh, until the 1960s when the Black Panthers mentioned it. And Stokely Carmichael said, we need to exercise our Second Amendment rights uh, to have guns because we don't have rights otherwise, so we need to protect ourselves. When he and other Black Panthers said that, the NRA um, uh, paid attention and almost, well, very quickly pivoted from an organization uh, that was dedicated to marksmanship and sportsmanship and safety to uh, champions of the Second Amendment. And uh, now the Second Amendment has become, to my mind, holy writ <laughs> in, in our culture. And that's problematic. And it, and it, reinforces, it reinforces this othering uh, that we uh, are inclined to, to engage in. And everybody, uh, everybody, regardless of what side they, they live on, uh, is tempted to engage in that, in that othering uh, practice. Paul, before you respond, Mark, I wanted to ask you a follow-up if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, you do spiritual advising, coaching for people. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, let's imagine a, uh, a imaginary situation here. Uh, uh, the United States, America, as a person, comes into your office and sits down in front of you, and it's angry, it's sick, it's violent. What do you say? How do you help this person or this thing sitting in front of you? I, I think in, in such a situation is to, uh, uh, if it's possible, to just spend some time in silence. Allow the temperature to go down. Uh, my experience, and I've had some clinical experience as well, is when somebody is that agitated to say anything, can just uh, just trigger some more uh, bizarre uh, behavior. So anything to to uh, reduce the temperature, be in silence. Let us listen to one another. Um, uh, listen to what the person is saying. I'm glad you said that. And one of the, just one of the observations that I've had after these horrific events, I'm sure that everyone experiences, is that there's so much there's so much discussion so much argument after a mass shooting event and there's not really a space there to be quiet and to sit with the grief where we might actually connect with something deeper that's going on or who knows maybe even come up with different solutions so thank you for for saying that mark um paul same question for you what do you think is happening from a mental health perspective, from a spiritual perspective, if you're inclined that way, and what would your advice be? Well, let me actually back up. I'm going to do this again because sure. we bypassed something, okay. but I will get to this fabulous question that you just asked. Um, so what is it that's going on? Um, I'm not so sure. If you actually sit down and talk to people, we find out we have a lot more in common than is immediately apparent. And so I think um, social media, the existing media, and the entertainment industry um, have a huge part uh, in glamorizing violence. Uh, also video games, I think I should say that. And I have this hypothesis um, that even though there are studies that show 
uh, that all of these sources, let's say the video games in particular, uh, do not cause people to become more violent. Um, and those may actually be pretty good studies. It occurs to me that there may be a very, very small number of people uh, for whom it actually does give them permission to be violent. And it's a number that's so small that it doesn't show up in the studies. And this is something, you know, I would like to, uh, I would like to see investigated. I mean, you think about it, you know, hell, you know, I, how many people do I know who play first person shooter games? And I just won't do it. I mean, it just feels ugly. It feels evil to me um, to practice something like that. Um, so that's a thought. Um, I think something that we haven't mentioned that's really important, um, the two-party system in our country as it has evolved. Uh, Michael Porter, a uh, renowned Harvard economist, uh, has uh, done some work uh, looking at duopolies and the properties of duopolies. And we have a duopoly that has our entire governmental system completely locked up and just as rigid as it can be and impervious to change and nuance. Um, so I think this is a key factor that we don't often get to. Um, talking about the NRA and the Black Panthers, uh, yes, I, it is a shameful fact that when the Black Panthers started carrying guns, uh, California suddenly got their first gun control laws and I don't think the NRA stood in the way of that. Um, now, I think, you know, you go to a shooting range or an NRA event, I think you're going to find a very, very diverse group of people. Um, so I think that's something that's been has been learned. Um, but gun laws have been based on racism or fear of the other back to the very beginning. I mean, the Sullivan Law, you know, the first um, uh, law, you know, that prohibited uh, uh, carrying guns, you know, in New York uh, was because of immigrants. Um, uh, one of the very first gun laws, you know, against sawed off shotguns, uh, well, that was because of Italians and the mafia. So yeah, there is, there is a very, very strong history between, um, gun laws and, um, othering, uh, of, you know, people who the elite are afraid of, um, I, th I think we're all, I mean, everyone is afraid. <laughs> it's not just the elite. Everyone is afraid and they do what they can to uh, minimize their fear, which is often not the best solution. It just it just ratchets up the fear even more. And that's the uh, culture that I think that we're living in today. Everyone I know, everyone I know, I don't care what their political or religious orientation uh, may be, uh, has kind of an experience of waking up at three in the morning with a pit in their stomach. Where are we going? Are we ever going to get out of this? And they may have all sorts of different ideas as to what to do, but I think everybody has that feeling and it's an awful feeling and it's uh, leads to despair. And when despair happens, then people sort of solidify their positions and, and, perhaps arm themselves either with ideology or with weapons or with something uh, to keep themselves sort of uh, uh, siloed off from the rest of the world. And so now if I could, I'd like to get to that wonderful question about the angry client, um, because I certainly have experience uh, with very, very angry clients. Um, and the very first thing uh, that I do um, is to validate their feelings. Um, the feelings are there for a reason. People don't get angry uh, just for no reason. It comes from somewhere. So to validate and to join with the feelings and then work to distinguish those feelings from beliefs. Uh, there is in uh, dialectical behavior theory uh, or therapy, this wonderful chart that shows how beliefs feed emotions that then trigger thoughts of a certain kind that strengthen beliefs. And so it's a cycle of rising anger based on beliefs. Uh, but the, you know, the emotions 
came from somewhere, somewhere real, some really bad experience. So to distinguish the feelings from the beliefs and then work on and soften the beliefs. Um, and by the way, um, I, I may have mentioned this before, uh, but um, I don't have that license plate frame anymore, but um, uh, I used to have a, a front license plate that said um, non-dual wisdom on the top, beliefs divide us on the bottom. And then the license plate frame on the back said, looking within, not knowing. Mm. And so my, pre you know, everything, I would like to say that everything I do in my life is somehow connected um, to what I call non-dual wisdom. And Mark, I haven't read your book, but I will say your title appeals to me immensely. And by the way, I consider what we're doing right here and what Braver Angels does to be profound spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. Not easy spiritual practice where you get together with people who all agree with you, you know, and you all, whatever, worship the same thing or whatever. Right? To me, this is rubber meets the road, mm -hmm. spiritual practice. But so, yeah, so that's, um, you know, that's how I uh, would work with uh, angry clients. And um I will say, by the way, you know, that, uh, you know, maybe getting a little bit personal, but I had some pretty real childhood trauma uh, that I got to work through, uh, through spiritual practice. Mm. And I won't say that I have perfected or completed that process, but I can claim absolute and total sincerity and that that experience, I believe, has enabled me to help others. Well, it sounds like spiritual practice has played a role. Thank you for sharing that, Paul, by the way, and, and opening you. up about that. Um, this played a role for all of us. And uh, Paul, you mentioned that we're not knowing and I could just feel that resonating across the mm -hmm. Zoom room here, because that's really what we're up to. Um, and that's really what you know we're aiming to do in these conversations and what this podcast is about too, is recognizing, yeah, we live in a dualistic world. We're divided by beliefs. Can we can we seem can we show up to one another and recognize how we're each holding mirrors to each other's beliefs and biases? Mm -hmm. uh, so, we're we're getting to a deeper place. Uh, the not knowing, I think, is uh, uh, I really appreciate that, and um, uh, I have a uh, a history with Zen myself. So lived in in Japan for a couple of years and practiced and studied Zen. So that still is. Uh, uh, a foundational part of, uh, of my spiritual practice. Interesting. So now I'm wondering whether we should pick up this, uh, <laughs> this not knowing thread and Zen and run with that. Um, I suspect it might make its way back in. So let me return to, there are a couple of questions that I really wanted to ask you both and wanted to make sure that we get these in. So, um, and maybe perhaps these are our last questions of the day. Um, okay. Two important questions for you both. Um, first is for Mark. Second is for Paul. So Mark, if we, if there were more restrictions on gun access for people, let's say there were more laws in place, red flag laws, we did more to kind of get our hands in there and prohibit, identify these people who are at higher risk, prevent them from having guns. How much do you think that would do for a person who's highly motivated to carry out some act of violence towards themselves or towards another person? Um, do you, at, at, on the whole, do you think it's doing more harm or doing more good than harm? Wouldn't this person still get a gun well, or some sort if, of weapon somehow? If, if we have more regulations, um, I, I'm going back, oh, I don't know, 30 years ago when it was mandated that we uh, have seatbelts in our cars and the incidence of, of uh, uh, serious injury and death went down a lot. I can imagine, and I'm of the belief that we were, were we able to do that uh, with guns, the level of gun deaths would go down significantly. Yeah. And uh, I'm aware that, that what, what often happens is as soon as uh, people on the left start proposing laws, people on the right think, oh, you're just, this is a step 
uh, that you're taking to get rid of all guns. And, and the issue of trust, I think, needs to be invoked here uh, because I, I think there are people on the left. I don't uh, uh, spend much time with them, but I'm sure there are who make a lot of noise. We need to get rid of all guns. That isn't going to happen, nor uh, it, it just it's antithetical to who we are as a country. Um, just sort of erasing guns is is not possible. But I think there's some things that we can do if we build coalitions, develop trust, uh, listen to one another, uh, engage in understanding so that we can uh, minimize minimize uh, the the chance of of uh, greater violence. Yeah. So that so actually multi, leads perfect multi multi-dimensional thing. I, I, I it's not unlike trying to reduce poverty. I mean, poverty is is such a complex issue, and there are so many threads. And what some people say, oh, if we just just deal with this thread uh, around the issue of poverty, we'll solve poverty. Well, it doesn't work that way. I think the same thing is can be said about guns. Just doing one thing is not uh, uh, is not enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And uh, I think you just touched on my next question. And what I think is really the way I see it, the deepest, most fundamental um, question around this topic of gun policy. And I think the fundamental fear for people is how much are you infringing on my rights? And as you said, Mark, is this one step closer to potentially taking away my guns or other freedoms? So my question for Paul is, we're just saying hypothetically here, we're just saying hypothetically, let's say that there was a guarantee, you know, with absolute certainty that the government would never take away your guns. If you knew that, and ev everyone knew that for sure, they're not coming after your guns, that's never going to happen. If you knew that that was the case, if you had that trust, would you be more in favor then of certain policies that ban certain types of guns, like you know, highly deadly assault weapons, or restrict certain access for certain people? Would you be more in favor of those policies, putting a little bit more restriction uh, than you're currently in favor of, if you knew that it's never going to really cross that line of someone taking away your guns? Well, Matthew, I have to say you're proposing a hypothetical that is so far away from my lived experience um, that I really can't address it without, you know, talking about my lived experience first. Um, living in California and in San Francisco. Um, and I, I I know, you know, I have to bring this in at some point. So this is probably a good point. Um I mean, the Supreme Court has made a major uh, ruling in the Bruin decision. And um, as I understand it, it pretty much makes nearly all the existing gun laws clearly unconstitutional. Um, well, now, unconstitutional has two meanings, at least. You know, one is one can logically see that something is unconstitutional. And the other meaning, which is far more difficult to achieve, is that somebody has actually taken a case through court and gotten the law struck down as being unconstitutional. And those two things are very, very, very far apart. Um, but I mean, I have to look at, you know, uh, it's not just a question of taking away guns. It's a question of raising the level of harassment uh, to a point uh, where you can't really use them or enjoy them, or there are just so many barriers in the way. And in San Francisco, you know, that has taken the form of uh, driving every uh, gun shop out of business uh, through laws that were specifically triggered uh, at a particular business and did not affect other businesses. Um, it's taken the form of so many regulations and so much harassment of shooting ranges that, um, you know, there used to be two shooting ranges that were pretty close to me. Now the closest one is uh, probably about an hour drive away. And they're all just kind of like hanging on by a thread. 
Um, so it's not just taking guns away. It's extreme harassment. And I mean, I have to say, you know, um, in the face of the Brun decision, um, I have to name a couple of things that have happened, how ugly it's gotten. Uh, one is the day after Broom, uh, the Department of Justice on their website in California exposed databases, several databases of gun owners um, in downloadable data format. And one of those was all the concealed carry weapon holders, including their home addresses. Uh, which included lots of judges, lots of women who had restraining orders out against violent spouses. Um, and, you know, although, you know, there's been an apology and, you know, some kind of offer of, you know, ID, identity protection. I mean, you look at that action and you just go, how do you explain something like that? Um, or then, you know, following on that, um, they have changed the requirements to get a concealed carry permit uh, to the point where it has become absurd at this point, you know, just out of the capability of most people. Um, and then passed another law uh, that basically makes it a felony with a concealed carry permit to carry a gun in so many different places that it's, you know, it's basically meant to make a concealed carry permit absolutely useless. So in the face of that kind of action, um, I have a really tough time, uh, you know, with the question that you've asked me. But that said, okay, now I will go. I will <laughs> go to that question. Thank you. I will pretend that I don't live in security. <laughs> and, you know, under that pretense, okay, if I had a guarantee um, that my guns would not be taken away, if I had a guarantee that I could buy guns as the technology evolved, and a lot of that technology is safety, safer guns. Um, and if that guarantee also included, though, um, non-harassment, you know, non-harassment of the businesses that are associated um, with buying and shooting guns. So it would have to be meaningful respect for the right. Yes, if there was meaningful, guaranteed respect for the right, then that's a whole new ballgame. But that does not exist. Well, I want to give you thank you for that, Paul. Um, and thank you for indulging my my question. I think it's and even just hypothetically, it's it's helpful to know how that shifts the the tone or the the emotional valence of this. And when I was picking up from you and from Mark here is again, this, this theme of trust again, how can we, how can the people trust the government? How can the government trust the people? Okay. With that, um, I wanted to just give it a opportunity for last comments, thoughts, reflections, if there's anything else that you wanted to add or reflect on for today. Uh, you said uh, government trust the people, people trust the government. And uh, I would say people trust each other. And, and that is a, a really challenging thing uh, today because there are forces and voices on all sides that don't want us to trust one another. And uh, I applaud Braver Angels for its uh, commitment to dive into these difficult uh, uh, issues and uh, bring people together uh, to find common ground. Uh, a key part of my book is uh, the no introduction of the mandorla, an Italian word for almond, which is the shape that's created when two circles intersect. Initially in medieval art, it was between heaven and earth, but now it's between red and blue, uh, uh, gun owners, uh, gun violence prevention folks, uh, pro-choice, uh, um, uh, pro-life, you know, you, you name it. Uh, are there places that we can gather in this mandorla space, not to pull one side to the other, but to find a place where we can uh, e express some solidarity and a desire to move forward in understanding with as many people as we can bring along as possible. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. That's a, a beautiful image as well. Thank you. Um, Paul, any last remarks or reflections? 
Yeah, well, this has been a real pleasure. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to uh, both of you. Matthew, it's good to meet you. Um, I had listened to a couple of your podcasts before, so I think I know a little bit about where you're coming from. Um, we all seem to have found uh, some affinity for uh, uh, Buddhism and possibly more specifically Zen uh, in our pasts. Um, and so, yeah, this has been a pleasure. Um, I think, you know, um, I think there is something very, very deep uh, underlying all of these conversations that when we get lucky, we begin to scratch the surface of. Mm. And I think that is um, mass insanity. Um, you know, and, you know, not I'm not trying to use that in a clinical way. I'm not sure that we have ever actually figured out what mental illness is, or even if it actually is a thing. Um, but there is just madness, absolute madness, um, and getting stuck in beliefs. Um, and again, you know, I, I hearken back to this duopoly. I mean, I do think the duopoly uh, is a huge part of our problem. Um, there was this TV show I was watching a while ago called Borgen, set in Denmark. And um, uh, in Denmark, uh, you know, they have a uh, parliamentary system where different parties have to get together to form a majority. And I found myself intensely envying uh, Denmark, thinking that, oh, my God, a political party actually has to make a deal with somebody who they don't completely agree with in order to form a government. What a fabulous idea that would be. And then I could even vote for a party that I actually completely believed in, or at least 90% believed in. So recognizing and addressing the madness of belief and fear feeding belief, feeding the fear uh, in that vicious cycle, um, that's the kind of answer that we really need. Uh, but meanwhile, you know, I'll, I'll keep my guns um, just for, you know, uh, just because I want to stay alive and I want to stay safe. Thank you, Paul. I can't express enough gratitude to, to both of you for taking the time to do this and for showing up in the way that you've shown up to this conversation and to the ones before it. I think you're both embodiments of what you're both talking about as far as showing up and listening. And even though we can still be on different sides of that circle, of that duality, uh, maybe we can bring it a little bit closer together or help to soften our beliefs a little bit. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.